We continue the subject of ethics and audit regulation uh, by moving to a question now called Melton. So the question is called Melton, and it covers the process of appointment. <coughs> so here we go. The question is called Melton. The directors of Melton Manufacturing have asked your firm to act as their auditors for the year ended 30th of September. They will be asking their existing auditors to resign. <coughs> as they do not provide a cost-effective service. Now, is that a reasonable reason for um, removing your existing auditors? Um, is it okay when you're shopping to look for value for money? Well, the answer is yes. It's perfectly reasonable. Um, when you're shopping for food, it's okay to look for value for money. When you are shopping for jeans, it's okay to look for value for money. And when you're shopping for an auditor, it's okay to look for value for money. So that's a perfectly reasonable reason for removing uh, the existing outgoing auditors. Well, at least that's what they say is the reason for removing the outgoing auditors. We don't know that it's true until we go through a process that we'll look at in a moment. But reading on. The partner proposed for appointment to Melton Manufacturing, which is our, in, within our partnership, the partner proposed for appointment to Melton Manufacturing holds a membership certificate uh, of registration uh, as a registered auditor through the ACCA. Did I say that right? The partner proposed for appointment to Melton Manufacturing holds a membership certificate and a certificate of registration as a registered auditor through the ACCA. So um, the guy at the top holds two registrations and we'll be looking at those as we work our way through. The proposed partner is scheduled for routine investigation uh, by the ACCA regu Regulation Monitoring Unit. Um, so this question actually starts with the process of appointment. It starts with the process of appointment and works its way down into audit regulation. So here we go. It's a good question, actually. A lot of coverage in there. <coughs> so question, Melton. Describe the investigations you would carry out and the ethical matters you would consider before you can accept the appointment as the company's auditor. Hey. Um, there are two processes that one goes through um, as regards um, taking a job as an auditor. One is the normal process that one goes through when taking a job, and another is very specific to audit. And you wouldn't do it if you were looking at taking a job at McDonald's. Um, if you were thinking of taking a job at McDonald's, what would be probably your main criteria for whether you um, accept or reject the offer? <clears throat> probably it'd be the money, right? Well, it's absolutely no different when you're in, offered a job as an auditor. Uh, is the money sufficient in order to pay for your labour? Is, is the money right? Uh, so number one is money. Um, and other things that you would consider, you know, if we go back to McDonald's, would be, you know, which particular McDonald's, um, what times of night would I be, what times would I be expected to work, would it be at night, uh, what's my boss like, etc., etc., etc. So all the sorts of things that one considers in the context of taking a job at McDonald's, one considers in the context of taking a job as an auditor. <coughs> that process is called client assessment. And it takes place first. So there's a first process called client assessment. And then there's something that you don't really do in the labour market. Um, when we're taking a job at McDonald's, I guess possibly you could, you could phone the outgoing chef and see what the job was like. You could do, but it doesn't happen terribly often. But in the process of audit, you must phone the outgoing auditor. You must speak to the outgoing auditor. And that process is called um, professional clearance. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide the eight marks between... The first four, which relate to um, the process of client assessment, and the remaining four, which relate to uh, professional clearance. And uh, that's how we're going to shape our eight marks. <coughs> Rereading the question. Describe the investigations you would carry out and the ethical matters you would consider. Um, well, it's absolutely true that number one in client assessment is the money. Um, but possibly because they've mentioned ethics within requirement A, maybe we should make um, number one the money, number two 
considering conflicts of interest, considering independence, and then we'll just think of other things for three and four. And that should bring us down to four marks. So here we go. Client assessment. Client assessment. <clears throat> so what do we say first? The money, didn't we? Fee. I would consider if the fee is appropriate to the amount of work involved. Uh, quite often um, when you are going through the audit process, the client will give you a sort of ballpark figure of what he's prepared to accept as an audit fee. And um, although you can quote to him um, a figure above that and see if he goes for it, if he gives you a ballpark figure, then probably, to be honest with you, he's got that in mind because he's got someone else who's prepared to do the audit in that sort of area. And if you don't like that figure and you think it's, it's way too low, then you'd probably just walk away from the job even without taking it any further. But if the client's idea of the fees seem to be in tune with your idea of the audit costs, then you go to the next stage, which would be you know, checking out the details of the client, starting with independence. <coughs> independence. Independence. I would next consider if there are any conflicts of interest between me, the auditor, and the client. I would next consider if there are any conflicts of interest between me and the client. I would next consider if there are any conflicts of interest between me and the client. And obviously if there are, then game over. You can't take this job. Going to the next possible question, what you might consider next would, would be very much up to you and there's all sorts of things you can say. I guess this is going to come high in your assessment of the client. You want to know the risks involved, particularly the likelihood that you're going to get sued. <coughs> next, I would consider the client risk, uh, particularly the risk that there would be material misstatements in the financial statements, particularly the risk of material misstatements. in the financial statements. The more mistakes they make, the, the greater the risk that we will end up being sued. And therefore, well, the less likely you are to want to take the job, frankly. Uh, next, I would consider the client risk, particularly the risk of the material, of material misstatements in the financial statements. Um, which leaves us with one, and you can go for whichever one. 
jangles your bells. Um, one that's coming to mind for me is geography. Um, if, you, if you're a very small audit practice, uh, concentrated in uh, Manchester in England, and you've got a, a global business, like, for example, Microsoft, then you can't do the audit. You're not big enough. Um, I would consider the geographic spread of the business and whether we have um, audit staff to do the job and whether We have audit staff to do the job. And whether we have audit staff to do the job. And that's just the four that I chose. You could have chosen um, four equally good ones. Having said that, I would definitely suggest you've got to mention money and you've got to mention conflict of interest. But for the other two, you can go for almost anything you like. Uh, would, what, what else would you consider? Um, whether you like the personality of the directors, whether you trust the directors, what you think of the strategy of the client, whether you think the client is a going concern, credit risk, that sort of thing. Uh, what sort of business the client is in? Do we have the expertise to deal with um, software engineering? Etc., etc., etc. So, what you chose for your second two points would be very much up to you. I, I happen to choose those two um, risks and geography. But the, the, the second half of the answer, which is professional clearance, is, is very rigorous. And um, it's given as a flowchart within the ACCA uh, guidance. So, I'm going to do exactly the same. I'm going to use a, a flowchart to, to show you what I mean by professional clearance. Profession, professional clearance. Once the above is considered, once the above is considered, I would contact the outgoing auditor I would contact the outgoing auditor uh, via the following flowchart via the following flowchart and before I give you the flowchart, I've, I've got to give you um, some sort of idea as to what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, we were talking about shopping earlier, weren't we? And um, as auditors, I guess if you've got the job, I guess if you've got the job, you don't really want the client shopping around, right? I guess if you're Tesco's, the supermarket chain, the big UK supermarket uh, chain, if you are Tesco's and you've got a loyal customer, you don't really want that loyal customer trying out other supermarkets. But if you're one of the other supermarkets, you definitely do. So really, we have to accept that shopping, value for money shopping, is part of business culture. The bit that we as auditors really cannot accept, the thing that we are really down on, is what's called opinion shopping. And opinion shopping happens like this. What can happen is you as an auditor find yourself bouncing against a director who has lied within those financial statements. You find yourself um, auditing financial statements that do not show a true and fair view. And therefore you communicate to the shareholders that the financial statements do not show a true and fair view. And what happens is the directors propose that you be removed. 
The directors propose that you be, be removed, right? Now, why is the director removing you? Is he removing you because of value for money? Is he removing you because of your incompetence? Is he removing you because it's just time for you to move on? No. What he doesn't like is your opinion. You've given a negative opinion to the world, to the shareholders, but also to the world, that he's a liar. You've said that the financial statements do not share a true and fair view in your audit opinion. Your audit opinion has been published, so you've called him a liar, and he's going through the process of trying to sack you. Now, when the incoming auditor comes in, the incoming auditor doesn't want to find themselves in the same position that we find ourselves in. The incoming auditor does not want to find themselves giving a negative opinion and then being sacked. Now, if you look at the question, the question says that the outgoing auditors are being... What's the phrase again? The directors of Melton Manufacturing have asked your firm to, ask as their audit, to act as their auditors for the year ending 30th September. They will be asking their existing auditors to resign as they do not provide a cost-effective service. Actually, do you notice they're asking the uh, existing auditors to resign? You can actually just fire the existing auditors, providing the shareholders pass a resolution to sack the outgoing auditors, and the outgoing auditors are gone. But... What they've said is the reason for this removal is um, the lack of cost-effectiveness of the outgoing auditor's service. And if it's true that it's just to do with cost-effectiveness, then we are happy as the incoming auditor. But just because they've said it's to do with cost-effectiveness doesn't mean it is. What we want to do is to find out if it's opinion shopping. Now, the way to find out if it's opinion shopping is to contact the outgoing auditor. That's why we're here. But hang on. We're the incoming auditor. They're the outgoing auditor. And we're going to be talking about the client's secrets. We're going to be talking about the client's secrets. We can't just, you know, just decide all of a sudden we're going to talk about the client's secrets between the two of ourselves without checking with the client. The first thing we have to do is consider confidentiality. So the first thing that we do is we speak to the client and ask the client, is it okay to speak to the outgoing auditor? And that's where the flowchart starts. So the first bubble is ask client can I speak to outgoing auditor Ask the client, can I speak to the outgoing auditor? And if the client says no, then you just reject the job. If the client says yes, then you speak to the outgoing auditor. If the client says yes, then you speak to the outgoing uh, auditor. Now, um, in real life, when you're speaking to the outgoing auditor, you probably have quite a sort of open-ended and uh, conversational conversation. Um, you wouldn't quite phrase it in exactly the way you would in a flowchart, but we're trying to do a flowchart here, so let's cut to the chase, as they say. What we're basically going to ask the outgoing auditor is, are you aware of any reasons I shouldn't take the job? In other words, are you aware of any opinion shopping? So we're going to say to the outgoing auditor, are you aware of any reasons I shouldn't take the job? Are you aware of any problems? So we're going to ask outgoing auditor, are you aware of any reason I should not take the job. Are you aware of any reason I should not take the job? 
And if they say, yes, there are problems, there are issues, then what we don't do is we don't automatically assume that just because the um, outgoing auditor is slagging off his former client, that necessarily it's true. I mean, let's face it, the outgoing auditor is called the outgoing auditor because he's on his way out. And it's human nature to, you know, on your way out, you're going to fire a shot back in the direction from which you've came. If this guy's being sacked, he's not necessarily going to be particularly polite to his former employer. And therefore, we don't automatically assume that he's telling the truth. He probably is, but we don't automatically assume that he's telling the truth. So what we do is we go back to the client and ask them, can they explain can they explain the issues? Can they explain away the issues? So we ask client can you explain away the problem? So you ask the client, can you explain away the problem? And the chances are that they say, no, I'm sorry, I can't really explain it. In which case you reject the the job. Um, But on the other hand, it's possible that the client is in the right and um, that the outgoing order to deserve the sack, in which case you'd accept the job. Actually, let's go back, back a step. Let's go back a step. Ask the outgoing auditor, are you aware of any reason I should not take the job? What if they say, no? Well, you accept then, don't you? Just check it out. Oops. So... You ask the outgoing auditor, are you aware of any reason I should not take the job? And the outgoing auditor says, listen, I really like this client. It's a shame that uh, they've grown too big for me because I've really enjoyed working with them. Uh, There are no problems with this client. Good luck. If the outgoing auditor says that to you, what do you do? You take the job, right? So that's accepting the job. Um, But let's go back to the the more complicated one where the the client and the outgoing auditor are having a fight. Um, It is possible that when the client and the outgoing auditor are having a fight, the client can explain away the issues. So let's go back to this one. Um, Ask the client, can you explain away the problem? Yes, they explain away the problem. Now, just because this is such a difficult one to get a hold of, I just want to give you a little story about this. It's not a real story, but it's a nice little made-up one. Now, imagine that you are auditing a, um, sorry, coming in to audit a client who've got substantial amounts of stock, and you, um, uh, you, you speak to the directors and you say, directors, do you mind if I go and chat to the outgoing auditor just to check everything's okay? And the directors say, no, 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 of course not, no problem whatsoever, here's their telephone number, um, you know, here's their email, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So you get the outgoing auditor on the phone and say to the outgoing auditor, excuse me, are there any issues? And they say, yes, there are issues, there are problems. The reason that we were removed was because we gave an opinion that the financial statements do not show a true and fair view. We gave a negative opinion. As incoming auditors, we instantly think, whoa, hang on, sounds like opinion shopping. So what we do is we go... We go back to the client and say, listen, we've just spoken to the outgoing auditors and they say the reason that you sacked them is because of their negative opinion in the last audit report. And the directors say, yeah, that's right, that's exactly right. The reason we sacked them is because we think they're rubbish. And to prove the point, here's the audit report. And you look at their audit report and it says this. Are you ready? Directors valued stock at the lower of cost than net realizable value. We believe stock 
should be valued at cost. Therefore, we believe the financial statements do not show a true and fair view. Now, it's not terribly likely to happen in real life, but let's hear it again. The directors valued stock at the lower of cost and net realizable value. We believe the stock should be valued at cost, and therefore we think the financial statements do not show a true and fair view. Who's right, the directors or the auditor? Well, it's the directors, isn't it? And the directors have explained why they've sacked the outgoing auditor. They deserve to go, and we can take the job. So that's the explanation there for yes. Let's check it out again. So we ask the client, can you explain away the problem? Can you explain away the problem? And the answer is yes, they certainly can. Not very likely, though, is it? Still, nevertheless, there's your flowchart. And that's how the process of appointment uh, flows. Uh, two subcomponents, just to remind you again, two subcomponents. The first thing is you ask yourself, uh, do I want the job? By going through the process of client assessment. And then you ask yourself, can I have the job? By going through the process of professional clearance. And we've done both. Okay, so let's move on to the engagement letter. In part B. Explain why it is important that an auditor should send a letter of engagement to a client prior to undertaking the audit. Um, the importance. It's a bit cute the way the ACCA phrase it. Importance. An engagement letter An engagement letter gets the contract down on paper to form evidence of what was agreed. What was agreed at appointment. The, an engagement letter gets the contract down on paper to form evidence as to what was agreed at appointment. Uh, you see, the thing is about um, accepting appointment is you accept appointment over the telephone. Um, you remember you go through this process of professional clearance, okay? So the client says, listen, um, we've heard good things about you. We want you to be our auditor. And so you say, right, okay, what sort of ballpark are you thinking in terms of the fee? What are your risks? Uh, are there any conflicts of interest? We go through that process of client assessment. And then we go through professional clearance. So we phone up the outgoing auditor. The outgoing auditor says, fine, but we'll be on the telephone now, won't we? We'll be talking on the telephone. Now, the chances are that once you've got professional clearance uh, with the outgoing auditor on the telephone, you're almost certainly not at the client's. So what um, vehicle are we going to use to accept our appointment um, as new auditors? We're going to use the telephone. So we'll phone back the client and say, listen, we've just been through that process of professional clearance. The outgoing auditors are absolutely fine with us. Um, listen, uh, we'd love to take the job. Thank you very much for the offer. I accept. So I've just said I accept on the telephone, right? And that, therefore, is the, uh, the vehicle for the contract. And we have a contract now. So there's a contract. There is a contract. The trouble with the contract is, though, it's disappeared, hasn't it? As soon as it's agreed on the telephone, it's disappeared. So what you do is you confirm the contract by writing to them. You write to them and you drive it round, actually, and you talk it through. And what it does is it puts the agreement down in paper. And the ACCA have a rather cute uh, sort of second reason, underlying reason, for putting it down um, on paper. And they say misunderstanding. What it prevents is, an, is future misunderstandings. Well, it can't prevent them completely, but it can certainly reduce them. Let's get it down. Let's see what the ACCA say, and then let's talk about it.
misunderstanding. The above should reduce the effect of any mess oops mess understanding of future of audit issues which is a bit bland isn't it if I'm really honest and it doesn't really tell you what the ACCA are meaning um, they know what they're meaning because you're just telling them back what, <laughs> what's in their rule book but let me explain to you what this means the classic example which is sometimes used in exam questions is fraud fraud can cause horrendous misunderstanding between you and the directors um, you take the job as auditor right and um, you agree to become the auditor uh, over the telephone. And then you write a letter of engagement and you actually drive it round to the client and you explain what you are going to do as regards audit. You explain all of those things that we saw in the auditor's report in the question Liverpool Football Club. And if you want to remind yourself of how audit works, you just look back at the scenario of Liverpool FC. But to remind you of one of the things there, we as auditors look for material misstatement. We do not look for fraud. If there's an immaterial fraud, we are by no means required to identify it. It's not our job to go looking for fraud, especially immaterial fraud, which has got nothing to do with us. But you can imagine that you take the job and then three years later, the directors discover a fraud. Whose fault do they think it is? They think it's your fault. They think it's the fault of the auditors. So what they do is they phone you up and they yell at you down the phone. And you say, hang on, hang on. Listen, I'm, you know, I, I am concerned that the, there's an audit. Uh, sorry, there is a fraud down at your firm. That's a horrendous thing. But it's definitely not my fault. And the director said, ah, but you are there to detect fraud. And we say, no, we're not. And they say, yes, you are. And then we say, no, you're not. And then we say, they say, <laughs> yes, you are. And we say, no, you're not. And you know, you <laughs> Now, how are we going to stop that argument? We show them the engagement letter. And there in the engagement letter, it quite clearly says, we are here to detect material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. We are not here to detect immaterial fraud. Ha <laughs> Then we got them, right? Still, it's not nice having the argument, but at least we know we're not going to get sued. And that is what the... ACCA mean when they say misunderstanding. The above should reduce the effect of any misunderstanding of audit issues. Basically, it ends any fights that we start between us and the client. They can still sack us, though. They can still sack us, but at least we've told them they'd be daft to sue us. Frankly, they can sue us as well if they want to, but they're not going to win. Right, so that's the, the purpose of the engagement letter. Um, and I think the next one asks about the content of the engagement letter. Briefly describe the main contents of an engagement letter which you would send to the directors. And um, here we go. B, part two. Main contents. The first bit is extremely odd. It's very, very odd. It's um, the address. Um, rather oddly, the engagement letter is actually addressed to directors. And I think I'll phrase it like that because it is very odd. Rather oddly, the engagement letter is addressed 
to di to direct us. Personally, I think this is really bad, actually. I think it should be addressed to shareholders. But it doesn't matter what I think, does it? Um, I mean, that, that's, that's the problem, isn't it? Back to agency theory. The shareholders over here appoint the directors to give the company direction. And then they appoint the auditors. The shareholders appoint the auditors. And, well, it's just wrong, isn't it? The engagement letter is addressed to directors. It's not actually the directors that are engaging us. It's the shareholders. But it's true, nevertheless. It is, it is that, yeah, the address, the, the, the person on the address of the engagement letter is the directors. As a body, particularly the CEO, the chief executive officer. I can finish this sentence to make it sound a bit cute, but I still think it's wrong myself. Rather oddly, the engagement letter is addressed to directors as shareholders' primary agent. as shareholder's primary agent. Uh, next up is responsibilities, which we'll go into more detail um, in the next question. Uh, the, the first main section... lists and explains the response the responsibilities of auditors and directors and it's mostly aimed at directors' responsibilities. The first main section lists and explains the responsibilities of auditors and directors. Um, our responsibility is to conduct the audit and report our opinion to the shareholders. Our responsibility is to conduct the audit in accordance with the international standards on auditing and to report our opinion on the true and fair view to the shareholders. That's, that's it. Our responsibility can be summarised in one sentence. The director's responsibilities are really quite huge, and we'll list those out in the next question. Uh, but that's the section that they appear within the responsibilities paragraph. So when we, when we pass the contract over and say, OK, this is what you've agreed, we talk them through what we expect from them. We tell them what we're going to do, but we also tell them what we expect from them. And that's in the responsibilities paragraph. We go into much more detail as to what we are going to do in a paragraph called the scope paragraph. Scope. Now this huge section explains in some detail in some detail how the audit will be conducted and it really is absolutely massive this thing this huge section explains in some detail how the audit will be conducted and um it goes through, well, I'm sure you can guess what sort of stuff it goes through. It's massive. It's about a page and a half long, and it talks about such things as what a test of control is, what a substantive test is, how sampling works, how we are going to assess the estimates and judgments, how we look at the accounting policies, etc., etc., that we have a responsibility for material misstatement, but we don't have a responsibility for immaterial fraud, all of this goes into the huge scope sec section of the uh, engagement letter. Then we've got extras, 
Sometimes these days they have a, a separate contract for the extras that we agree to do, but you can, you can put it in an engagement letter. You probably shouldn't these days, but it is quite traditional to do so. Um, then there is usually a section where the auditor explains the nature of any extra work provided like tax advice or um, preparation of the financial statements that we heard earlier from A, B and Co. Then there is usually a section where the auditor explains the nature of any extra work provided, like, as I say, uh, preparation of financial statements, preparation of financial statements and preparation of financial records. And then we've got the final section at the end. The final section at the end. which is S, which is signature. It's going to be a contract between us, the auditor, and then the directors. Again, it's a bit weird, isn't it? But it's a contract between uh, us, the auditor, and then the directors. So, obviously, both parties sign. Both parties. Auditor and directors sign at the bottom. And you might notice this uh, spells out a rather cute little mnemonic as you work your way through the letters that form the, uh, the first letter of each of those headings. Ah, what does it spell? There you go. That's what you show every time that you write an engagement letter. Um, and we kind of change tack completely now. Part C um, goes on to uh, audit regulation. I guess it's closely related to ethics, but it's certainly not the same thing. Part C now looks, looks at audit regulation. And it's quite a complex process, audit regulation. Basically, auditors audit themselves. But let me explain how. Explain the nature of the proposed partners um, to res, uh, registrations at the ACCA and how these registrations relate to audit regulation. Well, do you remember that? The, let's read it again. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the second paragraph at the top there. The partner proposed for appointment to Melton Manufacturing holds a membership certificate and a certificate of registration as a registered auditor through the ACCA. So he's got two registrations at the ACCA. He's a member and he's a registered auditor. And you know what membership is. That's what you're aiming for yourselves at the moment. Uh, to become a member, to become a member, the partner must have passed his exams to become a member the partner must have passed his exams and um, attained the uh, required level of experience and attained the required level of experience, which, as I'm sure you know, is three years. Um, so you know how membership works. What you probably don't know is audit registration. I'd be very surprised if you did know. 
Um, to become a member, the partner must have passed his exams and attained the required level of experience. So, here we go with the registered auditor. Which is a supplementary qualification that, frankly, very, very, very few ACCA bother with because it costs a fortune to be on the register of auditors. To be a registered auditor, the partner must have Um, attained further audit qualification um, to be a registered auditor the partner must have attained further audit qualification and um, well, in, in, in the context of ACCA as it stands at the moment, that's uh, Advanced uh, Audit and Assurance, uh, P7, uh, AAA. Uh, you get that qualification plus your membership and your membership experience plus some extra audit experience on top of that, then you have the qualification. But the real problem is the huge fee that you have to pay to be on the register. To be a registered auditor, the partner must have attained a further audit qualification and paid the relevant annual fee. Um, yeah. Um, so, why is it that the registered auditor has to pay a fee to the ACCA well, that relates to the second sentence. The second sentence gives you some sort of flavour as to how regulation works with the audit profession. Um, the proposed partner is scheduled for a routine investigation by the ACCA regula Regulation Monitoring Unit. Um, I'll use this phrase, although it's a bit te technical recognized supervisory body the ACCA is um, an RSB which means it holds the list of auditors and regularly checks. On, on the quality. The ACCA is an RSB, a recognised supervisory body, which means it holds the list of auditors and regularly checks on their quality. Now, the ACCA themselves, the board of the ACCA, don't go down into individual auditors, but what they do is they have a little uh, team of uh, audit superstars that go around the ACCA audit firms and check up on the quality of the auditors. Uh, the auditors do the auditing and they produce audit files and then the monitoring unit come round and they check the audit. So they audit the auditors' audit files. And this process is called monitoring and the unit that does it is called the monitoring unit. Monitoring unit.
the specific uh, body that audit audits the auditors is called the monitoring unit. And that's who these guys are in the last two words of the uh, paragraph just up there. They're the auditors of the auditors. The specific body that uh, audits the auditors is called the monitoring unit. Now, if you are inspected by the um, ACCA monitoring unit and you're not up to scratch, in other words, you're not following the international standards on auditing, so if you're inspected by the monitoring unit and you're not up to scratch, they can kick you off the register. If they kick you off the register, you'll never audit again. Um, should we call that control? Any auditors who are not up to standard can be removed by the ACCA from the list of registered auditors. And there you go, that is the method by which the ACCA control the auditors. It's the method by which the, the audit body supervise their audit firms. Okay, well, we're finished with that question, Melton. Difficult question, but well worth focusing on and practicing a few times because there's lots of good solid ideas in there.